We're going to continue in our series on um, apologetics. Our scripture reading today comes from Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The second installment of our apologetics a series. It was, I changed the name. It's faith in motion, but I changed it to a living faith, a living faith. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity uh, to analyze the scripture and uh, philosophy and reason around defending our faith. Once again, Lord, I pray that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord, but upon that nail, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. There's no point in me being seen today, Father. We need to hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 26. And just to give you some background on this chapter and where we're going to jump in before we go into some uh, deeper study of the of the, of the the um kind of the science of apologetics. Here we have Paul in front of Agrippa. And uh, Agrippa's kind of side, side man here, um, Festus as well. And it is an interesting conversation. Agrippa allows Paul to speak. That's the way that the chapter begins. Paul is happy for the opportunity to defend himself. And he says to Agrippa, you, he, he's happy, verse 3, because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me, Paul says, patiently, Acts 26 and verse 3. Here we have another episode of the apologetics, the defending of the faith. Of Paul, he goes into the fact that he was raised a Pharisee of the strictest cult of the Jews. Paul then begins to give the testimony of how he once tried to kill the Christians himself, how he attacked them. He talks about a meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus and how his life was changed all the way around. And how his name basically was changed from Saul to Paul is wrapped up in that story. He is here fighting for his life because the Jews want him dead. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 17, Paul is describing the work that he has been given by God to do. Acts 26, 17, he says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles and whom now I send thee. This is what he's, where he's been sent. And this is what he says he's sent to do to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul says, I've been called. I, him, he himself called out of the darkness of persecuting the Christians. Paul uh, held the coats of those who stoned and, uh, and, and, and martyred Stephen. Paul would follow the Christians. He would find where they are. He would report it to the authorities. Paul says, I was brought out of that darkness. He said, now it's my job to open their eyes. Now it's my job to release them from the power of Satan. Then he says in verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. 
but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul does not preach. Don't miss this. He does not preach some mamsy pamsy yelly, yellow bellied form of the gospel. Paul preaches and says, listen, if you're going to accept Christ as your savior, you've got to repent. But it's not enough that you say you're sorry for what you did. You've got to live a different life. He says you've got to do the works, meet for repentance. In other words, true repentance will not leave you living the way you're repenting of. He says in verse 21, because he preached this way, the Jews caught me in the temple and they went about to kill me. Paul said, preached in such a manner. You know, today people say, well, you know, we're going to talk more about this as we go through. You know, you just got to kind of preach love. Just, just be easy on people. Don't, don't preach anything that might cause people to be uncomfortable. That's not preaching. That's motivational speaking. There's nowhere in the Bible that, that, that preaching has no effect on individuals. That does not cause them to realize they're not living the way God says live. And that they need Christ as their savior. And that they need to turn it over to him. He says, because I preach the way I preach, and, this, and we took up the offering for religious liberty. Let me tell you something. Most people right now, people think they understand religious liberty. They don't understand religious liberty. They have no idea what is about to come upon us. No, they, especially in the United States. They have no idea of what's about to happen. Paul says, I preach the gospel the way it's supposed to be preached, and they wanted to take my life. Then he says, having therefore, verse 22, obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Paul says, listen, I'm not preaching anything but what the scripture says. This is what P Moses and the prophets said would happen. It didn't matter that they wanted to kill Paul. Paul didn't stop preaching because they wanted him dead. Paul preached louder because they wanted him dead. That Christ should suffer. This is what he says comes from the, the scripture from Moses and the prophets. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, as Paul was speaking for himself, Festus speaks up. It's Festus guy, I'm telling you. Kind of gets annoying if you really read this thing carefully. Festus speaks up with a loud voice. Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. Festus said, Let me, Paul, you don't study so much, you don't went crazy. What are you talking about, man? What kind of foolishness are you talking? Here's what Paul, and notice the respect Paul gives this guy. Acts 26 and verse 25. But he said, I am not mad. Most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He says, I'm speaking with a clear mind the words of truth, most noble Festus. There's nothing crazy about what I'm telling you. Jesus did die and was resurrected. And then he turns to King Agrippa. This is where it gets interesting. Acts 26 and verse 26, he turns to King Agrippa. Paul turns to the king, for the king knows of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, you know that Jesus was crucified by Pilate. You know that there were soldiers sent to guard his body. You know that there were witnesses that, know, that saw that he came out of the grave. You've heard the reports. It wasn't done in a corner. All of Jerusalem knows. 500 witnesses were there when he ascended to heaven. He says, you know, Agrippa, this thing wasn't done in a corner. It wasn't hidden. Ha. Huh. And here's where it gets interesting. Paul says, Acts 26 and verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? King Agrippa, you remember earlier in the chapter, he says that King Agrippa was, 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 was educated and knowledgeable in the customs and the writings of the Jews. He turns to him here and he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? 
See how he calls him on the table? Makes him make a decision, as my, my Jamaican mother would say. He has to, he says, if we're driving and somebody wouldn't make up their mind, she'd say 7 Eleven or 21. Make up your mind. Do you either you believe in the prophets or you don't? And then Paul really gets him. I like this one. Paul then looks the king in his face and says, I know you believe. Acts 26 and verse 28 is really powerful. Agrippa responds, the king responds and says unto Paul, almost you persuadest me to be a Christian. Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. This church is the work of apologetics. To be able to give an answer when others question why we believe it is, it is our ability to be prepared to give an answer. Remember, we talked last week, apologetics as derived from the Greek word ap apologia, meaning speaking in defense. What is apologetics? It is reasoned arguments or writings in justification of something, typically a theory or religious doctrine. We, we use the, the text from 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, where Peter says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. To every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So Paul, as we see last week when we looked at him on Mars Hill and this week as we see him before Festus and King Agrippa is, um, is, is, is wonderful. And one of the things Paul does is he connects with the people he's speaking to and uses what they have in common to draw them in. With King Agrippa, it was, the, it was the fact that they both believed in the scripture and in the prophets. And he pulls King Agrippa in. King Agrippa, as he's sitting there having to make a decision, I'm sure what's running through his mind is the power he has, the position he has, the money he has, the life he has. And as he's thinking about it, he can't say, Paul, you're wrong. What Agrippa is really saying is, do I really want to give up my lifestyle for this gospel? And this is where many Christians fail. Satan, I say this all the time, I say this when I give my testimony, Satan is just as good at using success as he is at using failure to lead people from God. So let's look at some of the arguments. I'm reading a book by R.C. Sproul's um, in Defense of the Faith. He's a classical apologetic, and he does some great writing. And so some of the stuff he brings out, I don't agree with everything he says, but there's some interesting things that each one of us are going to have to do. Last week, I showed you some questions. We'll come back to those questions in the next couple weeks. But the arguments, and the first and most uh, difficult thing that you have to deal with is, and these aren't three different things that kind of overlap, the existence of God. You see, none of what we're doing matters if God doesn't exist. If there is no God, none of this matters. And so there has been extensive work done to erase and remove God from everything. The second thing is, can you, do you understand and can you look at the historical evidence? We'll briefly touch on this as it is relevant as we go forward over the next couple of weeks. What I'll linger probably more on today is the third one, which is the authority of the scriptures. You see, in my opinion, if you can establish the authority of the scriptures, everything else falls into place. Because if the scriptures are what we believe they are, then our understanding of God is, is outlined in the scripture. Amen? We, the historical evidence, we understand that where history doesn't meet, match with the Bible, history will one day catch up. Where science doesn't match with the Bible, science will one day catch up. We're going to talk about um, Copernicus and Galileo. We have some interesting talks coming up of how science and faith intersect. As a physician, that's been a challenging thing. I, I went to Loma Linda for residency in public health, but I went to medical school in Miami where I had one Latino professor, a cardiologist, just one in the whole four years that didn't use evolution as the basis of his teaching. He said, God, he started our class, our, our, the cardiology lecture, he started by saying, God, he didn't say God, he said, the heart was designed and my, my, you know, head, whoa, wait a minute. They didn't say it evolved. He didn't say it evolved. And as I listened to him lecture, 
I could pick out this man is a believer. Because he would never use the word term evolution. He kept using designed. We'll get more into that as, as we go through the next couple of weeks. But here we go. So let's look at the existence of God first. Psalm 14 speaks to um, what, this, this, what, 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 God, what David writes about God's thinking on this. He says, the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. If you read the next two verses after that, it continues showing you that one of the reasons the devil wants God removed from society is it is a, a default that as God is removed from society, morality decreases. So you have people just doing whatever they want. And this is what I believe in, in, uh, to, uh, um, in essence happened before the flood in the antediluvian world. That they, 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 they got so debased in their rejection of God that after a while, violence was the only currency they used. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Here's what Paul says, and we're talking about a living faith today. You have to have a living faith. Romans 1, verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? Live by faith. So Satan understands that if you do not have faith, you cannot be saved. He works his entire, he works your entire life, that's a better way to say it, he works your entire life to convince you not to trust God, not to believe God, to abandon your faith. That is Satan's primary work in your life. Because righteousness is by faith. The just shall live by faith. All of these things happen because we believe. And this is why you live in a world that excoriates our beliefs. Works tirelessly to remove and separate us from our beliefs. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says it like this. But without faith, it is what? It is impossible to please him. It is impossible to please God without faith. Why? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, the purpose of apologetics, the purpose of understanding what you believe and why you believe it and being able to give a defense is more than just having an intellectual understanding. In fact, I would submit to you that there are many who have an intellectual understanding of the scripture but will not be saved into the kingdom. I'm going to show you more on that in a second. It is not simply to win arguments. In fact, as I get older, I'm not interested in arguing with people because what I've learned is most people you argue with aren't really interested in learning. They're interested in winning. They're not discussing with you so they can grow. They're discussing with you so they can be victorious. And sometimes many of them will argue with you and it's not until they're on, the, on their uh, pillow at night that they finally allow some of what you said to settle into their minds. But the purpose of this is more than just defending the faith or making an argument. It is the perfection of character. It is so that we grow in Christ, that we study these things. Watch this. James 2 and verse 17 says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is what? It's dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you th thee my faith by my works. James says, thou believest that there is one God? You do well to believe there's one God. He says, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Watch this. There are those whose faith their Christian faith, or Christian appearing faith, is more superstition than it is a living faith. There are some who believe, listen, I'm a Christian because if I, you know, and, just, and you can tell because they come back to the church when they have problems. Or they come back to God when they have problems. They pray when they have difficulty. That, that's using God like he's some kind of lucky charm. It's not a living faith. You see, a living faith is consistent. It stays with God through the highs and through the lows. You don't lose a loved one and your faith grow out the window. Uh, you don't get bad news about your 
past or your history or your, or your present state and your faith goes out the window. A living faith grows. It challenges. It pushes back against the difficulties of this world. You see, the devils, they believe. Ask yourself, is your faith any different than the faith the devils have? Some, some Adventists, you know, they, if they see just the wrong symbol now, you know, we watch so many videos on YouTube, they see a, a, a symbol, they were, whoa, and they're running for the door. They serve certain instruments in a church. I was at one church, and, and somebody came in, and, and there was a set of drums up front. And I'm not saying you should have drums in your church, but there was a set of drums up front. This part, they walked in the church, saw the drums, looked at each other, there's drums, and they ran out the back of the church. Somebody had to run them in the park. That's not our drums. That, that belongs to the church that rents it on Sunday. That's superstition. Not afraid of ornaments. Of, or, or, they have no power. You see, faith without works is dead. In fact, this is what uh, Ellen White says, Christ in the Sanctuary, page 119. She says, there is too little prayer, too little real conviction of sin. And the lack of living faith leaves many destitute of the grace so richly provided by our Redeemer. The work of conquering evil is to be done through what? Through faith. Those who go into the battlefield will find that they must put on the whole armor of God. We're talking about this in Sabbath school today. The shield of faith will be their defense and will enable them to be more than conquerors. Nothing else will avail but this. Faith in the Lord of hosts and obedience to his orders. You see, some people want you to believe you can have a faith where you believe in Jesus, but you don't have to obey Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you really have a relationship with him, you're not going to be trying to find some back door into heaven. You got folk that are trying to figure out the trap door, the sneak way in. Like, like can they have the homeboy hook up and somebody let him in the back of the movie theater or something? To try and get into heaven. No. If you're going to come to God, you must come in at the door. Which means we are, we are, we are given the commission that we, our, our faith must produce obedience. She says in uh, God's Amazing Grace, page 33, vast armies furnished with every other facility will avail nothing in the last great conflict. Without faith, an, an, an angel host could not help. Living faith alone will make them invincible and enable them to stand in the evil day, steadfast, unmovable, holding the beginning of their confidence firm unto the end. Did you get that? You know what Jesus says? Jesus says, um, and he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. It will take a living faith. It will take a living faith. Matthew 8 and verse 28. And when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, this is the devils believing. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Are you come hither to torment us before time? The disciples didn't believe who he was, who he said he was. The Jews didn't believe who he said he, he was, who he said he was. Isn't it interesting? The demons believed immediately. Some of us aren't doing any better in our faith than the demons. They have more respect, more fear of God than we do. And here's the thing. Their belief will do them no good on judgment day. Faith must be a living faith. It's got to be bigger and stronger. This is why you've got to study. You've got to go into the world. You, you can't have a relationship with someone you don't spend time with. And it's important that you have doctrine. John 16, 13, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. When the Holy Spirit comes, when you have this faith and you, and you pray and invite in the Holy Spirit, when that Holy Spirit comes in, the scripture says he will lead you into all truth. So it's not enough to be like, you know, I believe whatever happens now happens. Once saved, I'm always saved. No. 
You've got to dig deeper and learn these truths. As you learn them, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal to us what is going to happen in this world. So number one, the existence of God. There's a few things that they put together here that, um, that, that is mentioned in that book that I thought was interesting. One of them is the law of cause and effect. He says, listen, at the end of the day, there has to be a God because of the law of cause and effect. There was a time when people believed in the theory of a spontaneous generation. And those of you who studied biology or biochemistry undergrad, I know there's some here who have, you remember they taught us about it and they said, listen, that was debunked. It's not true. It can't happen. Um, in order for something to exist, it had to come from something. Nothing, something can't come from nothing. So something had to exist before the world existed. And we know the world exists because we're in the world. We can't discuss the universe if it doesn't exist because we wouldn't exist either. The law of natural theology and natural revelation. So one of the things that also is important is that every human being has been given a revelation of God through nature. It is the first textbook. It's one of the reasons why it's so important to study nature. It's why I'm, I'm glad I, I majored in biology undergrad. It, you, 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 learn, you learn a respect for God. I remember when we were studying whales and we were learning about how they have a, um, a countercurrent in their fins in order for them to um, heat up their body. So they, these whales are mammals, they, you know, so they've got to go up and down. They go down to these freezing cold waters. They're warm-blooded animals, and in order to keep their fins warm, the, God has designed the, 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 the flippers and the fins so that as the warm blood comes out of the body, it heats the blood returning to the body from the, where it has now been cooled because the, thin, the, 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 the flipper or the, or the fin is so thin. So it heats it as it goes back in. And, and the way it is, it's like, how would, that, how would that evolve? I mean, how many millions of years would they be frozen finless before they finally the thing kicks in and they get heated fins? You understand what I'm saying? Nature itself re reveals that there must be a God. The second law of thermodynamics, read it. The world isn't evolving. The th second law of thermodynamics in physics tells us the world is falling apart. The universe is falling apart. And there is also a moral imperative. We'll get more into the science of it later. But when you look at nature, when you look at the things like the bombardier beetle uh, and other, I mean, you look at just, I mean, it isn't, it, the idea that all of this happened by accident, there must have been a great designer. Someone had to. Let me tell you something. You, you, you drive cars, and man, people have been designing cars for over 100, probably 100 years already. More than 100 years, actually. 122 years they've been designing cars. A car aficionado. And I like German cars. The Germans make amazing cars. And they still break down. With all that engineering and designing, all the years of studying, they fall apart. Yet, the world does not move so far out of its orbit. It is perfectly balanced Earth in its distance from the sun. If it was any bit further away, it would be too cold. If it was any too much closer in, it would be too warm. It is a perfect balance. You live in California, and you know how they get water? It is by the fact that the mountains rise so high. They collect the snow that must melt to supply the water. It's like somebody had to sit down and figure this stuff out. Water starts leaking in your basement. You don't walk upstairs and say, you know what? It'll just, it'll just evolve. The, the whole, somebody will figure out how to get the water out of the basement. It'll just happen somehow. The water will just disappear. God is a God of intention. And the evidence of God is in the intentionality of nature. I, 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 listen, I, I can't stand the cold weather in the winter, but it is impressive to think that during the summer when you need shade, the trees have leaves. In the winter, when you want the sun to shine through and melt the snow on the parking lot, the trees have no leaves. And someone will say, well, that's just an accident. Here's what Paul says, Romans chapter 1. The first and great sin that man had is tied up in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. I'll read it again. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, here's where it gets interesting. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Why is the wrath of God revealed from heaven against these people? Why? Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. He did? How? Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and glory and Godhead, so that they are what? Without excuse. On Judgment Day, when Bill Maher, the great atheist on HBO, goes before the judgment seat of the living God and says, I, it's not, don't blame me, I, I just didn't believe you were there. How could you not believe? The evidence of God is all around us in nature. And this is why they will be without an excuse, even if they never had the Bible. Oh, y'all missing this thing. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What does the Bible say? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Once you remove God from your heart, your heart will darken. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. They said, listen, we're smart. We figured out technology. We know science. Right? they become fools and change the glory of the corrupt, uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Paul almost describes evolution in reverse, creeping things, the four-footed beasts, the birds to man, the way that they, you know, this, this, this succession uh, from the primordial sludge that somehow ma um, almost magically the, the, these proteins just happen to be there. Where they got the amino acids from, I don't know, to make the proteins, but they're there. And then some kind of lightning strike hit the sludge and the first cell was So no, they don't put up statues like in ancient Egypt of half man, half birds, and half this and half that, and, and bow down to golden calves. But you worship the created when you say it is from the created that you were created. Here's what Paul says. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. So what happens? After a while, then they begin to lust. Then you begin to get moral, complete moral decay. decay. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Sexual sin slips in. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Medical ministry, page 10. All nature is alive. Through its varied forms of life, it speaks to those who have ears to hear and hearts to understand of him who is the source of all life. Nature reveals the wonderful working of the master artist. Let me tell you something. I, I was on the road. I forget the name of the road in Jamaica. And the trees come over the road. And we were going um, from Sa Sav Lamar, technically Savannah Lamar, but Sav Lamar up and going north. And as we were driving, and the mountains were in the background, and the, 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 the greenery is a perfect bluish green. When you hit the water, the water has all these different shades perfectly light. And you say, how could you not believe in God? Even here when it snows and you look out the window, it's so beautiful. All of that is a reminder that despite the ravages of sin on this world, God is still the greatest of all artists. Nature. But there's also the historical evidence, historical evidence. Now, 
some would say you can't trust the Bible. Here's where here we, we I don't, I've read some of this to you before, but I'm going to go back over it. This is Josephus. This is from his Testimonium Flavianum, and this is what he writes. So for those who say, well, Jesus didn't exist. There was no Jesus. The, you know, the, he wasn't the son of God. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man. And Josephus is one of the great Jewish historians. I learned about him while I was in Israel. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one to, ought to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was, he was the Christ. Josephus never became a Christian. And when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, speaking of the Sanhedrin, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him, did not cease, meaning that the church continued to grow. Watch this. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life. In other words, he, he was raised from the grave on the third day. For the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians, so called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. So when they say, well, you know, this stuff the Bible teaches is, is not true, it's Here's a Jewish historian, doesn't become a Christian, but he says, listen, this guy, he was the Christ. There's the other side, Tacitus. I've read this for you before, but Tacitus in his annals, annals 15.44, Tacitus, and this is a picture um, of, of Nero as Rome burned, and they started to, to take the Christians uh, and put the Christians to death. Remember, Nero blamed the burning of Rome on the Christians some say he actually wanted to expand his palace and start a fire on purpose, but it got out of hand because of the way that the architecture and houses were built at that time. Here's what uh, Tacitus says. Tacitus says, Pilatus, speaking of Pilate, Pontius Pilate, consequently to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations. Who were hated for their abominations? Called Christians. By the populace, Christus, the speaking of Jesus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius. Procurators, Pontius. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Tacitus, a Roman historian who clearly is not a Christian, hates the Christians because he's a pagan who believes in Jupiter and Mars and Athena and all the other gods of the Greeks and the Romans. He hates the Christians, calls us an abomination even. But he noticed he verifies the existence of Christ and the growth of the church. Powerful stuff. This leads us to understanding the authority of the scriptures. The Bible is trustworthy. We talked about that two weeks ago. The scripture can be trusted. And there's a lot more. I won't get into the Dead Sea Scrolls again today. Um, but, but let me show you. Romans 1. This is why Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek the just shall live by faith. 2 Timothy 3 uh, and verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, is Paul speaking to Timothy, which are all are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. He said, Timothy, you knew the Scriptures since you were a child. The Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. This is why the Bible will always be under attack. But Paul says it like this to Timothy, and to us. All scripture is given by inspiration of who? Of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? In righteousness. How did we get the Bible? God gave it to us. It was given by inspiration of God. Why did he give it to us? Paul tells Timothy that as well. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, the Bible does not waste time trying to prove God exists. 
So people will say, you know, prove to me from the Bible, God. The Bible doesn't do that. In fact, the Bible does the opposite. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God. It means when you come to the Bible, you come to the scripture knowing that God exists. Why do you come to the Bible knowing God exists? Because you've already seen his evidences in nature. And then people say, well, it's been translated. It's been this, it's been that. And I, again, I can show you from the Dead Sea Scrolls and even older documents. And I'll show you some archaeological stuff here that also supports the scripture in a second. They say, well, it's been translated. In fact, Muslims um, say this a lot. They, they really challenge the Bible on the fact that it's been translated. But I want to give you something that I learned at Oakwood when I was studying in one of my religion classes. Uh, one of our professors, I don't know if it was Elder Shand or Elder Cleveland, who said it, but they said this something powerful. They said, the Bible is not word-inspired, it's thought-inspired. God breathed the thought on the man, and the man wrote the thought in his own words. When you read the Bible, your job is to do what? Extract back out the thought. That's why we pray for the Holy Spirit. Before you study the Bible, you pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you. Because it's the Holy Spirit that breathed the, the thought in. It's the same Holy Spirit that will bring the thought into you. And your studying and understanding of the Bible will become clear. Can you trust the Bible? Absolutely. They said, Jer I showed you guys this a couple weeks ago. They said Jeroboam never existed. Then they found this. This guy bought this for like two or three dollars at some market in Israel and found it was um, Jer the seal of Jeroboam. His name is written on it. Absolutely Jeroboam existed because the Bible is true. Historically, it's true. Look at this. 2,700 years ago, Tiny Clay P sealed the deal for Bible's King Jeroboam II. And they, this is Archaeology Digest showing that, no, actually, yes, they found evidence of this king that they said probably never existed. Recent archaeological finds in Assyria corroborate scripture. They're finding things that show that the Bible is true. Another one here, an archaeological dig reignites the debate over the Old Testament's historical accuracy. Um, beneath the, a desert in Israel, a scholar and his team are unearthing astonishing new evidence of an advanced society in the time of the biblical Solomon. You have not believed cunningly devised fables. When I showed you the Dead Sea Scrolls, I could go, I, I mean, we could go on and on about Dead Sea Scrolls. I remember that the only book, or the first book, I should say, that they found in its entirety that predated any other Hebrew text by hundreds of years was the book of Isaiah. And I believe that was God who did it. And I remember when they took us to the, to the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls are held in, when I was in Israel um, and took us to the place where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I was in awe that God had kept these things all those centuries so that in our day, the rocks would cry out. From archaeology, the rocks would crowd as the book of Isaiah is intact. And when you translate it, it translates to our Isaiah. Why is that important? Because it is the prophecies of Isaiah that are, are some of the most pointed in showing us that the first time Jesus came, he was the Messiah. Now we know that those prophecies existed long before Jesus was born. And even when you read Tacitus and you read uh, Josephus, these non-biblical historians, when you read even the Quran and it's mentioned of the fact that G uh, Jesus was born of a virgin Mary, when you look at it, all of that prophecy was fulfilled, but it was written long before Jesus was born, which means you can trust the Bible. Prophecy, one of the most things, it connects us to heaven. Here's what 2 Peter 1, we read this before, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn, and that day star arise in your hearts. Church, the reason studying and knowing prophecy is important, it is an anchor for your faith. When you go back and read Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and you are able to march out the kingdoms and, you, and even a mention of Cyrus by name in the scripture hundreds of years before he was born. All of these things give us a, a, a living faith. Why? Because you realize that you're not just believing and wishing on some star. God has given you enough evidence to hang your faith upon. So this is what Peter goes on to say. Knowing this first. That no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
Listen, when you read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, it speaks of pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. I could go through Matthew 24 and show you how it follows the, the recent history of the last couple hundred years, almost to a T, and in ways that could not have been fulfilled in earlier times. Prophecy allows us to not believe blindly, but to understand that the Bible, it isn't simply a, a, a way to, 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 to draw us closer to God. It is a road map of what is to come. That's why Paul asked Agrippa in Acts, 20, Acts 26 and verse 27. That's why he asked him, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? And I want to ask you, church, even those listening online, do you believe the prophets? Do you? Because if you really believe the prophets, it's difficult to live like the rest of the world lives. If you really believe the prophets, if you really believe God's word, it's difficult to just be like everyone else in the world. If you really believe what God says in his word, if you really believe the prophets, there should be a transformation. You ought not just have some faith like the belief of the demons. You ought to have a living faith. Martin Luther, the great reformer, talks about a living faith, a faith that transforms a life, purifies the character, and prepares the soul for eternity. That's why Agrippa said, Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian because he believes, but he doesn't want to believe all the way, too much to lose, too much to give up. Even our, even our church, our denomination is going to face some hard times going forward. We're going to hit crossroads where either you're going to believe what the world says believe, follow what the world says do, or you're going to be in trouble. And we're going to have to make some tough stands. And I'm not talking about stuff like what we got going on now with the pandemic. A lot of people think this is it. No, it's about to get much worse. He said, I would, I'm almost persuaded to be a Christian. Paul says to him like this, he says, I would to God that not only you, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these bonds. Meaning, I wish you all were Christians like me. I just don't want you in chains like I am. Paul had a living faith. His faith was alive. And when, no matter how hard they hit Paul, Paul came back with scripture. Last couple slides. Message to young people, page 63. Satan will seek to discourage the followers of Christ so that they may not pray or study the scriptures and he will throw his hateful shadow athwart the path to hide Jesus from the view, to shut away the vision of his love and the glories of the heavenly inheritance. It is his delight to cause the children of God to go shrinkingly, trembling, tremblingly, and painfully along under continual doubt. That's what Satan wants for you. To always and continually be in doubt. She says he seeks to make the pathway as sorrowful as possible. But if you keep looking up, not down at your difficulties, you will not faint in the way. You will soon see Jesus reaching his hand to help you. And you will only have to give him your hand in simple confidence and let him lead you as you become trustful, you will become hopeful. You see, hope, hope is, the, is one of the things that is produced by faith. We live in a world that is hopeless. Pati I see patients all the time, no hope, living in constant discouragement, have no, no sense of belonging, no, nowhere to look for their future. They're just hopeless. And many of them try and use alcohol or weed or cocaine or sexual exploits or, or, or pornography. They try to gambling now is a big thing with the legalizing of gam sports gambling in the state. People try and find some other way to find hope, to find meaning, to, 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 to numb the pain that the loneliness of sin causes. But I tell you, there is no medicine in the pharmacy that can resolve the 
pain that so many in this world have. There is no program on Netflix, no song on the radio that can really deal with what most people are being challenged with today. Here's the thing. God made the human heart so big, only he can fill it. If you try and fill a God-sized hole in your heart with all those things I mentioned, you'll simply become addicted to all those things. The God that we serve is soon to return. And unless you are wrapped up, tied up in him, unless you're connected to him, in a personal way, unless you have a living faith. When he comes, he won't recognize you. One of the primary reasons that we have to be able to defend the faith that we have, as we learn in apologetics, because we need to be sure of what we believe. Satan is going to try and knock you off the, off the horse of faith. But hold on. He that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. I'll close with this. I remember, um, I probably told you guys this before, but it reminds me of a patient I had who came and wanted anti-anxiety medicine. And she was up and down arguing with me about how she should get, I think she wanted like um, um, a benzodiazepine. Don't you want to, you know, one of the, one of the benzos. Um, I don't remember which one, maybe Ativan. Or, or, or one of them. And she, she wanted this thing so bad. And I took out my prescription pad and I wrote on it 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. I wrote her name and a date and I signed it and I handed it to the lady. The lady said, what is this? Are you crazy? What is this? This is not medicine. I said, ma'am, this will make you feel a whole lot better. And I recited the scripture, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Ma'am, you need a sound mind. So she starts joking with me. So what do you want me to do? Should I take it? Uh, do I take it three times a day? I said, yeah, you should take it three times a day. <laughs> she said, should I take it with food? I said, no, it works better when you're fasting. <laughs> God's word, church, and his promises we ought to be memorizing his promises so that when the day comes when we need to stand, we have the word, the sword, as our weapon against the enemy. Church, Jesus is soon to return. And this wicked world is about to be consumed in fire. And I pray that we all would have the living faith so that when Jesus comes, we are caught up to meet him in the air. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to study more about apologetics. Lord God, I pray now that you continue to bless us with your truths. Have your Holy Spirit move on all of us, Lord. Draw us closer to you. Help us, Father God, to be your children and your servants. Lord, let us not be Christians in word or through superstition. Let us not simply believe as the demons do. Father God, help us to have a living faith, a faith that produces good works, meat for repentance. Father God, we would have the character of Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus, we pray again that you return soon and take us home. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.